Oh Lord, we come before you, open ourselves and allow you to see us as we are. We know that you do not see as we see, and yet you love us. Amen. Well, today is Refreshment Sunday, also known as Leter Sunday, also known as Mothering Sunday. And all of those names reason out that this is a time of pause, reflection, refreshment, and perhaps a little lightness in the midst of Lent as we hit our midway mark. Now, Lent is a season when we are called to do some hard spiritual work, when we are called to perhaps do a lot more repenting, a lot more reflecting on who we are and what we carry as sin in our lives. And we do this as we walk towards the passion of Christ, which we will experience again in Holy Week, and also towards Easter Day, which is our day which really celebrates everything that we are as the body of Christ. So if there's any time for us to really attend and listen and perhaps open ourselves to see, it would be now. So although I'm wearing pink, many others who are gathered at worship are also wearing pink. We're not going to do just a, a light and easy sermon today. No, we're going to be brave and dive in and explore a little bit further exactly what is sin. The word sin appears in the Bible in many different contexts, and we find this word being used today in the gospel passage, this wonderful story of healing when Jesus takes mud and his saliva and puts it on the eyes of a man who was born blind, and he makes him see. Now, it's a very complex situation that then unfolds because... Sin is something that was present from the beginning of this little interaction and also proceeds out as something that was in question. First, it's the disciples who asked Jesus, who was it that sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, this is the context of, of course, Second Temple period. And in this context, there was an understanding of prosperity being something that was gifted or given as a reward to those who were righteous, and that those who suffered often suffered as a result of sin, of being separate from God and possibly separate from society. So there's already this preconceived notion that if someone has got something going on with their body, that it is actually a sign of something spiritual and that it is possibly showing that there is sin present in that person's life. What do we see then happen after this? Jesus not only is going to heal this man, but he heals him of his physical ailment as well as his social one. Here, Jesus asserts that this is not actually because of sin that this man was born blind. And in fact, he says that this was so that God's glory could be revealed in him in his life. What a radical statement for the people who heard it. This would have completely turned the tables in all of the disciples' understanding of what sin was, how it looked in the world, and how they could identify it. But it also was so topsy-turvy that it led to an inquiry with the religious of Jesus' day with the Pharisees who then called in the man and questioned him, called in his parents and questioned them. And still, because they were not able to really comprehend what this meant, they cast this newly healed person, this person who should have been restored into the bosom of the temple, out of the religious circles. This is, in a sense, a real difference in what we see Jesus saying is the blindness of the Pharisees versus the blindness of the man who had actually experienced this physically in his life. Unfortunately, it is the reality that the sin that kept the Pharisees in their own knowledge and didn't allow them to expand what their experience was to receive Jesus, to see him as who he was, it kept them in sin. At the very end of the passage, Jesus says, your sin remains. So what do we learn then from this particular passage? 
we can see that Jesus has done away with one of the cultural precepts, which was an idea that suffering somehow was given to those who were bad or sinful or who had done something wrong. Suffering is a result of living, not necessarily of sin. But that doesn't mean that sin doesn't cause us to suffer, which is exactly what the Pharisees would have experienced in remaining aloof, in not being present with Jesus to see who he was and the further miracles that he gifts, as well as his teaching, which was about love, not about law. And so they remain spiritually blind to who is before them. So for us, perhaps we can see here that there is a challenge to even our preconceived notions of what suffering is. When we have something that happens that is bad to us, do we automatically wonder, what have I done wrong? Maybe. Maybe we wonder this about others. Oh, they're having a really hard time. What have they done? It might be there. It might still exist in our minds. But Jesus did away with that, transformed it, and asserted that any suffering that we have, particularly in body, is not necessarily a sign of sin. So going a little bit further into this understanding of what sin might be and how we all live with it. It's not something that we as Christians are exempt from as soon as we come into faith and are following Jesus and all of a sudden that's it. We have all the sins washed away forever. They are washed, but we go on living with this as a reality. And it is a journey, not just something that we receive as our destination in belief but through our life of faith, it's something we will come up against again and again and again. So in the lesson from Ephesians today, this letter from um, this passage, we have only a few verses, so I'm going to read them. But this is going to help us take on a few different motifs to consider sin further. It says, for once you were darkness... But now in the Lord, you are light. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what some people do secretly. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, sleep awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So here we have for us spelled out a little bit more of what sin actually is. Sin, if we were to use the motif of dark and light, is the dark stuff. And we live with this as a reality in our world, for without dark, there could be no light. So we are constantly surrounded by both. But if we live as children of the light, then we actually make a conscious choice to try and set our spiritual sights on the light of Christ, to make that our focus and not the dark things. And what are the dark things? The dark things are the opposite of all that is good and right and true. Often they are things that sit beneath the surface, that lurk. And we are told to expose them with the light. That is exactly what we do when we repent, when we confess, and when we receive absolution. And we do this at Holy Hermits Online every time we come together for worship. We have an opportunity to think, what are the dark things in me this week? What are the dark things that I need to bring to the surface, to bring to Jesus' light, so that Jesus can shine on those things, expose them for what they are, and take their power away for us to continue anew carry on afresh, receive that forgiveness and try again, knowing that likely we will need to repent the following week once again. In fact, it could be that repentance is a daily practice for us 
many of our daily prayer services and liturgies that exist in the church invite us to consider what the things that we have done or said or just exist in the midst of that we need to confess and bring to God's light. Because it isn't just about rebelling and being disobedient and wandering away from God intentionally, we are surrounded not only by our individual moments of darkness, but also by our darkness as a society. Whatever it is that violates God's fundamental purposes for us are moments when we touch or are touched by darkness. One of the things which perhaps we celebrate together, especially as we're so in tune with the call to caretake creation in our companion animal ministry at Holy Hermits Online, which we hope to build further. In fact, only next week we'll be meeting to work on that more together. And that is that our primary purpose in life is not just to be loved by God and love God, but to love others and also to look after the creation that God has made and gifted. And so it's very easy for us to see our corporate sin in the way that the world is, in the way that creation is hurting, in what we do as a humanity to not necessarily fulfill our task as caretakers for all of creation, but only to look out for our own interests. So it's very difficult for us then if we are carrying all of this as a collective into those moments of repentance, confession, absolution. But that's where we can be reassured that when God's light touches them, there is a redemption for us, that salvation that is offered and the opportunity to try again and perhaps to change. I'm going to leave us with perhaps one of the most loved and most used psalms ever, Psalm 23. And this one is used often as what we would call a lorica, um, as the lorica of St. Patrick, whose feast day is only just passed. Weeks and weeks ago in Lent, we also celebrated the lorica of St. Gildas, one of our holy hermits. And it is a prayer which calls upon God for protection, protection from the darkness that we face. And this psalm is one which we can also use as a protection prayer, one where we are inviting God to guide us as we have to face those hard things where we know that we will fail at our tasks of loving and being loved and caretaking for creation, but that we are children of light. And so we have the new opportunity to try again. So this is our well-known psalm but I'm going to pray it as if it's for all of us because the psalm is translated in the first person, but we're going to do it as a community. So I will pray this one for us as a protection prayer, one that we maybe take on as we continue to choose to look upon Jesus, to receive that salvation as light and to reject all that is dark in the world around us. Let us pray. The Lord is our shepherd, therefore can we lack nothing. He will make us lie down in green pastures and lead us beside still waters. He will refresh our souls and guide us in right pathways for his name's sake. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil, for God is with us. His rod and staff comfort us. The Lord spreads a table before us in the face of those who trouble us. He has anointed our heads with oil and our cups shall be full. Surely God's goodness and loving kindness will follow us all the days of our lives. And we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. So if you face any dark parts in you and have need of light, perhaps refer back to Psalm 23, wherever you are and whatever you're doing. If you have a moment of fear, fear that maybe you've sinned or that there's sin touching you, need only look to Christ, our light, 
for that safety, that protection, and that opportunity for renewal and to live as a child of light. Amen.